investors can pick partners to align with to build quality deal flow. Mentors and other service providers can understand where their services will have the maximum impact. And providers of these programs can learn from others and improve the quality of their services. If you're connected with early stage social entrepreneurship in any way, this is the session for you. I'd like to introduce our moderator for the session, uh, PR Ganapati Guns, as everyone calls him. Uh, he's the Chief Operating Officer at Vilgro. He's an experienced business executive with global leader leadership experience and a proven track record in scaling B2B businesses. A significant portion of his experience has been in the outsourcing, financial information, research, and telecom sectors. In addition to mentoring rural social enterprises in the Vilgro portfolio, he volunteers a part of his time to help teach for India and Chennai. I'm going to let him uh, introduce our panelists and take this forward. Thank you. We have on my right, Mesh Sashte, who is the CEO and founder of Beautiful, who is the vernacular voice recognition and voice biometrics company. He is kind of the head of the class research bar. On this panel, particularly, we love Mesh's perspectives on the benefits that he enjoyed from being a part of an incubator. Uh, he's been a part of two incubators, the RTBI at IIT Chennai, as well as uh, part of Wilgro. Uh, and what he saw as benefits, and then what are some of the shortcomings of the incubation programs that he saw, and what an, uh, an entrepreneur should look for when they look at choosing an incubator. So that's the perspective I'd hope to get from Umesh. Uh, Dave Richards is the founder and uh, managing partner at the United Seed Fund, uh, which is a very exciting uh, early stage fund investing in impact enterprises around the world doing some very interesting work and scaling up their operations here in India. So in some sense, he's a consumer of the work that incubators do, incubating early stage enterprises and preparing them to be invested by someone like Dave. We'd love to hear his perspective on what he sees from current incubators and what are the challenges he sees and what he'd love to see in his ideal incubator, or whether incubators are relevant to the process at all. So um, I know Dave has some uh, provocative thoughts and we'd love to hear those and you know, trigger some discussion. Ross, of course, is the co-founder and founder of Village Capital, a very exciting and innovative uh, incubator in some sense, operating around the world. And uh, we'd love to hear what you do, how you incubate companies, what your perspective is on the role that incubators have uh, within the value chain of mm -hmm. taking mm -hmm. an enterprise from an idea to a reality where it's making a difference on the ground. And so maybe we can start with you and you'd, you know, give us an overview of your view of what an incubator does, what its role is, and how it can enable really and accelerate the success of enterprises in this space. Yeah, no, thanks. So we'll kick off and thanks for moderating the panel. I hope I can get a nickname as cool as Guns one day. <laughs> it's, uh, that's the best part. Um, I, so I run an organization called Village Capital. We operate um, programs for early stage entrepreneurs around the world. We've done uh, 18 of these programs. We just launched our 18th last week um, in partnership with CIIE at IIM Ahmedabad. Um, we've done three other partnership programs uh, with Dazra uh, here in Mumbai, um, and we've had an incredible experience working with great partners here in India. So, um, but we've also done programs in London, Brazil, China, Kenya, uh, and across the US. And we've had about 300 companies go through. And so maybe I'll start with a, a global perspective, because we've, 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 we've done 18 of these programs. Some have been great. Others have not. Um, we've uh, met a bunch of different incubators. And I, I want to start by just by saying what differentiates a really good incubator accelerator from one that isn't. And that is uh, a very clear value proposition for the entrepreneurs and if, if investors are also your customer um, for investors. So um, there are some, uh, and there, there, there are some people who say, you know, come here, we'll give you support, we'll give you mentoring, and we'll find you investment. And it's, it's pretty unclear what that actually means. And if you look at how incubators themselves measure what they do. They say, oh, we did X number of consulting hours, X, Y number of introductions, et cetera. Um, and to me, that's, that's very input driven. And I think, you know, they could be 1,000 consulting hours that are bad advice. Or they could be, uh, you know, introductions to people who aren't that helpful. Um, I think that uh, really good incubators, so there, I mean, I'm just thinking around the world outside of the social space. Like, there's a group 
uh, in Boston called Bolt, and they are for tinkerers and inventors. And they say, you're an inventor who doesn't have business sense, but you've got a thing, um, and you want to turn that thing into a business. You are probably a bit socially awkward because you're an inventor in your basement. Like, you're not going to go out and network and meet a co-founder. Um, our job is at the end, you will have a co-founder who has a business development sense. You will have a written business plan. You will be introduced to 10 potential customers that have a sales pipeline. And we think that that, and we, we'll put $10,000 into you to give you a start in manufacturing your thing. That's very clear value proposition. I know what I'm going to get out of it. Um, or they say, or you know, others, like we originally, um, when we originally ran our programs, we uh, at the end of our program, what makes us a bit different from other groups is we, we provide investment capital, but it's peer selected. So we say, you know, there are 15 in our group in Ahmedabad now. We'll invest 50,000 in two of them, and the entrepreneurs themselves decide. Um, originally, it was just us providing the capital. We've started uh, requiring that at least half the money come from a local co investor that has a later stage fund, and for them, this is a strategic investment. So IIM, we're, we're co-investing with Arohan Ventures that is doing impact investing and looking at this as deal flows. We say not only will you, you know, two of you get money, like you will be selected by the investment committee for this later stage fund, and this is in some ways accelerated pipeline for a fund that we, we think is very good and we think would provide a lot of value to you. And you know, people like United Seed Fund who we hope we'll invest in the cohort, helping select the cohort. And so it's not who we think is great. Our value proposition is accelerating investment to people. So we have investors say, I want to I see how these guys play out. Um, so all this is to say, like very, very simply, um, I would encourage any entrepreneur out there to say, what, what am I going to get out of this when this is done? And I would encourage an investor to say, how is, how is this going to help me fit my mission, my mandate, my fiduciary responsibility, and the incubators that answer both of those well are the ones that, that I think provide the most value. Wonderful. That's a great um, you know, opening introduction, I think, to what entrepreneurs, what incubators do. I think we'd love to get an entrepreneur's perspective now. You participated in two incubation programs. What value did you get out of it? What do you think didn't work as well? What would be your dream incubations, uh, incubator uh, and uh, incubation inputs that you would like to get? How would you guide entrepreneurs who are in the process, you know, should they at all align themselves with an incubation program? And if so, what should they be looking for? We'd love to hear your thoughts on this. So, so I think to, to begin with, in my mind, the definition of an ideal incubator is, is sort of an entity or a program which looks at either the entrepreneur or a business model which is not mature yet, but has a potential and sort of says, I will, I will take you on a journey where you reach maturity and you're ready to sort of become a business. Um, so that exactly the same thing happened to us. Uh, I, I tried to build a venture outside of incubation, which struggled, which is when I, I encountered IIT Madras's incubation program. And, and you know, the people there were, were quick to recognize that these are the business gaps in the team that me and my co-founder and the initial employees had. Uh, and they said, hey, we can, we can bridge these gaps, right? So to, to Ross's point, there was a directed pitch made to us that we will do this for you. You lack like this. Uh, the incubator could have done much more, but we recognize that, hey, we need uh, mentoring. I think the biggest thing that we got out of the first incubation, which is IIT Madras, was mentoring. And I think when Wilbro came into us in our life cycle, it did more of an accelerator's job rather than the initial early stage incubation because that was done by another entity where a different set of mentors, a different set of skill sets were added to the team uh, who sort of said that, hey, Unifor, you've reached this point for you to now go on a very fast growth path where you can attract the next round of funding, where you need certain type of people. These are the steps you should take. And these were coming from people who had seen that life cycle. Right? So I think even in, in, the, in the list of mentors, it's very important to have people who have seen things from scratch to say, you know, a level up, to a list of people who've seen from the level up to the next level. That's the role of the accelerator, really. Uh, and I think that's the ideal thing that incubators should do. I think in terms of list of services and so on and so forth, I personally had this opinion that, end of the day, the, the success or the failure of the enterprise is the entrepreneur's mandate, right? The incubator can guide, can help, can mentor, but the outcome of it, so for example, hey, we will find your co-founder, uh, 
I think the statement should be, we will help to find your co-founder. But at the end of the day, it's your responsibility to pick your running mate uh, and to pick the ideal guy. If you don't like it, you don't like it, right? So, but I will introduce you to places where you can hunt. I will tell you how you should hunt, right? But beyond that, the outcome is, is your responsibility. And I think as the list of services grows, uh, sort of a word of caution that to the entrepreneur, there is a lot of unlearning at the end of the incubation program because you're in a mindset that my, my HR is taken care, my accounting is taken care, my legal is taken care, and one fine day the incubation ends, right? As the entrepreneur, you're no more the innovator or the inventor, but now the head of the business, and you are now beginning to build these functions, right? So if an incubator really wishes to provide services and which are good early stage, there should be a roadmap to, to handle the entrepreneur saying that in the next six months, these services will begin to go away. Start making your own arrangements, right? We've got you here, but from here on, it's your responsibility. And to really teach the entrepreneur that you know these are important business functions. Your company will not scale without accounting, legal, HR, and so on and so forth. And the incubator can't do it for you always, right? So for me, the incubator should restrict itself to good mentoring. And I think to quickly sort of come to what um, entrepreneurs should look when they are looking at a series of options in the market today and more and more coming up is that I think like all things in life more than the brand or the organization it's the people for me that you know the entrepreneur is willing to work with uh, so for example for me in IIT Madras's incubator there were a set of people that I thought could add value to me in Wilgo there are people like Guns who I thought could add value to me more than what Wilgo has as a brand been doing and so on and so mm -hmm. forth. Because, you know, I will not be working with the entire organization. I will be working with two, three touch points in, in the organization. And for me, it was important to figure out that were those touch points uh, going to help in the journey that I've taken. It may be good for somebody else, but does it, you know, work for me or not? So I think the entrepreneur has to be um, uh, just evaluate, you know, what are the type of mentors, what are the type of services that he would look to derive out of that program, that finite limited time program, and then move on in life. Um, as I said, a lot of my peers in both incubation programs, in certain failures have started to go in a mode that, hey, the incubator didn't do this, or I will be bailed out by the incubator. Well, this is not a job that you're doing. This is your company. You're responsible for the outcome. And I think the incubator has a lot of role to play in communicating that all the time every day. Great. Thanks a lot, Amesh. Um, then we'll move to uh, Dave, and I'd you know, love to hear your perspectives as somebody who has looked at investing in companies that came through incubation programs, that came to you where the uh, founder had in the traditional way built the business in the backyard, in the garage. Uh, you know, do you see distinct differences? Do you think there is a value, a role for incubators to play? Is there something they're doing right, something they're doing wrong? What would your advice and suggestions be to people who run incubators or to entrepreneurs you know, who are beginning to start businesses and are looking to choose whether they want to go through an incubator or do it themselves? Sure, sure. That's great. Yeah, I think, um, I think the good news is that uh, in, in India, um, I think we're going to see a lot more incubators, or if we want to call them accelerators. I'll talk about that more in a second. Uh, and the reason I'm, I'm sensing that is I know there's some there's been a lot of success in the U.S., especially with tech companies and a few other sectors. And so there's a lot of funders now that actually want to fund uh, more of these kind of things for social businesses now in places like India. So I think the good news is there's going to be a bunch of incubators um, that or accelerators are starting uh, or, or ones that are going to expand that are currently going in the next uh, couple of years. Uh, I, I think that I would really agree with Ross's point that it's really important that um, though that an incubator be very clear. There's not one size fits all incubators. Um, I think that's, there's been some confusion um, with a number of the incubation programs um, that I've seen where they haven't been clear on who, their value proposition, who they're trying to attract uh, and have a focus. And so it's, think of it as a unique, unique value proposition. So a incubator, just like a good business startup, has to have a very clear focus on what value it's delivering. And uh, one person I was just talking to earlier today said, he, you know, his suggestion was, he said, what can, sometimes incubators get confused um, in places like India between um, small businesses and very high growth small businesses, <laughs> potential growth businesses. 
In other words, um, there's some very nice businesses that will always be nice small businesses, and they could be profitable or whatever. Those are a very different genre or, or have a very different set of needs than a business that intends to be very large, intends to be very um, uh, substantial in, in a relatively small uh, amount of time. And so I think that's an, an example of a differentiation. There might be an incubator that focuses on really small businesses that, that tend to be small and is a nurturing, but it's a different, um, a different goal. And I think one of the reasons that this is important is you want to be able to attract relatively like um, approach entrepreneurs to these incubators. Because one of the biggest values of an incubator is the peer-to-peer -peer support that comes in. And um, I, I've seen the best results when you, when you bring the dyna dynamicism of a great cohort that have similar kinds of objectives, not the same business or whatever, but similar kinds of objectives to help um, uh, inspire each other further. Uh, and to make more progress. So that's, um, that's, that's one element. Um, another thing that I think is really critical from my observation is, is the leadership of the incubator. I think if you're an entrepreneur, that's one of the key things that you want to choose an incubator from, is who is leading the program. And um, I had an interesting conversation with uh, a person who runs an incubator, a social business incubator, the other day. And he, this person is uh, a serial entrepreneur. They're, they're a very successful entrepreneur. They've started multiple companies and sold them and, and had exits and different things. And I was asking him the question. I said, um, what do you think? What, what kind of skills do you need to run this kind of you know, operation of, of running a, a, an incubator accelerator? And he said, he says, I, I just don't know how you could do it well if you weren't um, and hadn't been a successful entrepreneur. And I said, well, why, why is that? I mean, why can't you just hire a program manager, just more the logistics, to get everyone to talk and bring in mentors and everything? And he said, well, the challenge I have is that when I'm running the cohort, I'm getting, every hour I'm getting multiple questions from entrepreneurs. And they're asking me, what do I do about this? Or what do you think about this? And if I haven't been through it, I don't know how I would I'd be able to answer them well. I would have to say, well, we'll wait and get a mentor to answer that. We'll wait, we're, and it just slows down the whole process. So it was an interesting perspective, and I think that there's some merit to that, um, that the leadership of what will, will set the DNA and could very well influence the, the results um, of, of the success of a, of a program. Um, um, another thing I've observed is um, uh, I think that the new, there is kind of a new model. Think of it as 2.0 or 3.0 or whatever you want to call it of um, what, what were formerly known as incubators. <laughs> uh, I think the new model is, is, the, is more being referred to now as an accelerator. And I think the reason people change terms is the incubator model was much more paternalistic. It was more about, we know what to do for you, and we're going to help you make your business, and that kind of model. And it tended to be longer periods of time um, and more uh, intervention. The new model that I think is, is showing much more results uh, is this more, people refer to as accelerators. So you could call it incubator 2.0 or whatever term you want to use. But it is more of a model, like you're seeing, of, hey, let's find entrepreneurs that, that really um, innately have something that they, and, and some skill sets to go do things. We're, then bring them together and help them uh, re, uh, refine those and, and make progress on sort of key things. And so, um, again, I would encourage, I, I think from an investor's standpoint, um, that model of attracting entrepreneurs that are relatively more self-reliant, relatively more capable of taking things forward, is going to be more attractive to an investor. Because when the incubator goes away or the accelerator goes away, this person needs to stand on their own two feet uh, mm -hmm. and, and move mm -hmm. forward. And so, um, I think that's another um, thought. But I'll, I'll stop there. Okay, great. Thank you. And uh, welcome, Manfred, to the panel. And uh, you know we've only got four column mics, so you're going to have to <laughs> use the handheld mic. But uh, Manfred is uh, the head of uh, private sector development at the GIZ. And uh, GIZ has done some very interesting work and has been pushing incubators to uh, share best practices, to grow and improve their uh, operations, and to also incubate other incubators. So uh, they've been a driving force behind really that movement that Dave spoke about. The, you know, the increase in the number of incubators in the country. You've also been very influential on the policy side, advising government and what they can do to bring about more incubation and support more social entrepreneurship in the country. So what I'd love to hear from you is your perspective on how you see the social incubation scene in India. How do you see uh, incubators and the role that they play, especially from the 
the 30,000 foot level and uh, some perspectives from Delhi from really the discussions that you've been having hopefully uh, you and your colleagues uh, with policy makers and how they view incubation and uh, you know what role that has to play in the overall development sector in the country. So. Right, uh, thank you. Um, you, could uh, you could see that we, we came late to this party. Actually, we worked for 55 years in India in MSME, finance, uh, in skill development, in energy, in environment, before ever touching base with impact investment. Mm -hmm. And uh, this thing, which I thought uh, now is called incubation, but now it has got another name, and we remember, we remember it as a sort of entrepreneurship uh, development. Mm -hmm. So we are new and we talked to a lot of you and um, let me just say two things. One, uh, what we understand the challenges and two, what we are doing at the moment uh, with regard to that uh, challenge. The challenges with regard to incubation from all these discussions with you for me are three. Uh, one, there is a challenge of number, of numbers. One, uh, two, there is a challenge of the quality of the portfolio of services. And three, there is a challenge of sort of the business model, the upscaling model. The numbers is easily said. We have 100 something and we want 1,000. So that's factor 10. Um, more interesting is the question of quality, the, the composition of the services of the portfolio, which definitely has to go beyond brick and mortar, beyond, say, the, the physical infrastructure. And some things have been mentioned, mentoring, networking, business models, marketing, but I think one uh, service is, is key, and that is filtering. Filtering the right entrepreneurs, because all the training will be wasted if it's the wrong people. And sometimes we tend to forget that, especially if, if we are, say, from the government side or from the NGO side. And we are too soft on that front. We need a filter function. So in a country like, like Germany, we have 4% of the people uh, being entrepreneurs, 4%. Uh, after the war, we had 15 or 16 percent. That was by necessity. So I would suppose here also a lot of people are doing it by necessity, but not by sort of their, their basic character. I mean, 4 percent in India would be 50 million people. And if you take into account that you have 30 million MSMEs, micro, small, medium enterprises, so there's still 20 million out there, you have to find them. But you have to find the right ones. So that's the basic service, I think. Um, then uh, very crucial for us as, say, public money spenders, and also, I suppose, for government of India, is that there is this impact thing well-defined in the sense of you're going rural, yeah, or you're going towards sustainable and inclusive innovations, not just any sort of uh, entrepreneur or any, any investment. And then the third one, I think there is a challenge of the business model. So how can you grow and make a, uh, make a business out of it? And how can you sell your services differently? So is franchise, for example, a, a, an option? Or can there be plans of paying as you grow? Can you pay your service providers with shares, for example? Um, how do you do tie-ups with investors? And uh, on the flight uh, to, to Mumbai, I thought maybe you also have to have a, a greenfield uh, experience in the sense of imagine you would never know about all this incubators and just imagine what type of services would you need and who would be best suited to provide these services and how do you fit it together. My point is there are others, there are NGOs, there are associations, uh, there are cluster development organizations which can provide part of those services. So how do you sort of create a system in which they have their role? Because only through, say, the, the classical incubator, I don't think you will reach to that scale you, you want to wanna reach. Um, just to, to conclude what we are doing, uh, we are working with CIIE Amdabad on incubating incubators, so the question of, of networking and training, hand-holding, trying uh, about the scaling up model. So with Unlimited, we try to sort of uh, replicate their model. With Enovent, something similar. Um, and when, with IntelliCap, we are working on virtual incubation. I have worked in skill development. I don't believe in pure virtual. Yeah? It will be a blended form of, of training and a blended form of hand-holding, which also has on-site and, and real-life uh, part of it. Um, another thing is the flow of funds. People talk about the 2%. Okay, 
uh, an issue. Access to credit once you grow is an issue. We work in MSME finance for a long time, so making that bridge is, is important to us. Um, the development of the market of the impact investors is an important thing, so self-regulation, transparency, avoiding what happened in microfinance in this area is, is an important thing. And then business and investment climate, yeah, the climate in which you operate. We work with the ministries, we have a chance sort of to, to be heard and, and influence that one. Sometimes ministries can create markets even for entrepreneurs. Yeah, you take the RSPY smart card health, uh, in the health sector, that basically gives taxpayers' money, subsidy money, to the final client who can make a choice. So if government permits private providers to provide health services, they created a market in which the private deliver public services at the end. And, and that's, say, a good, a good outscaling thing. A lot of other things later. Thank you. Great. Uh, you know, some of the questions that, uh, points that came up in the conversation, this guy is I'd love to hear your thoughts and perspectives on it, Rob. A concentrated program where you bring everyone in physically mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, run a tight uh, uh, two weeks or, you know, one month, whatever that might be, versus a more extended program that involves, you know, the sort of thing that Umesh went through where he's provided a set of services and then works on the idea. Um, what are the pros and cons between the two and, you know, why did you choose one versus the other? And what we've spoken about, don't rep entrepreneur in a particular situation and something mm -hmm. else is suitable in another. How would you guide entrepreneurs that are in the audience or somebody who runs an incubation program on whether they should choose between one and the other? That's a great question. Just to get a sense of who's in the audience, how many of you are entrepreneurs? Because, uh, how many of you are investors? You guys should all meet each other after the session. Um, how many of you work for incubation, acceleration programs, broadly defined, or are thinking of starting one? Um, okay, uh, we've, we've tried a lot. Um, we, again, we've, we've, we've had a lot of uh, misfires and a lot of ones that we've been happy with. Uh, I would say that from our standpoint, there have really been two things that have distinguished the, the successful from the unsuccessful in terms of program structure. I'd say one, um, it's one of our partners says uh, an accelerator should not be a, a sage on the stage. They should be a guide on the side. And we see a lot of development programs where it's like, you guys know nothing. We know everything. We will tell you how to make your business successful. That's, that's, the, that's a fairy tale. Um, there's so much luck in building a successful business, first of all, that anybody who tells you that is just, just not true. Um, the, we will, you know, help you increase the odds that your luck pays off by making, you know, we won't tell you who your co-founder is, but we'll introduce you to lots of people that, and, and walk you through choosing a co-founder is, is much more successful. Walk you through the process of how to build a company is, is, uh, is, has been more successful. That's why I think Dave, having an entrepreneur run an incubator, I think is absolutely critical. So leadership is, is one thing. And second, in terms of structure, what we have found is you need constant, product or service, customer interaction, feedback, and then you come back to your mentors, your investors, or your guides and say, here's what we saw, what are we changing based off of what you're seeing, and then you go back out. So the residential program, I mean, we, we did one where they all lived in the same place, uh, and it was difficult because they got a lot of sages on the stage telling them inspirational things, but it was like they got inspiration overload and they never got a chance to try any of it out. And when it was all over, they could try like one or two of the things and then something blew up and they, they, they didn't know what to do next. Um, where we have hit on, um, and I'm not saying it's the right way, this is just kind of where we, we've settled, is if we go off of a broader geography, we bring people together three times over three to four months so that they get targeted coaching from people who can be useful. They go try stuff for a month, they come back and see where we're going, they try stuff and hopefully through a couple of rounds they have enough to get a little kickstart. Or if we have, say if we had everybody in Bangalore, um, we, had, we would have everyone meet weekly on Monday nights talking to Dave about here's what happened last week when I tried that sales thing you told me, um, and here's why it flopped, like what, what do I do next? Um, and so strong leadership that can guide people and not preach at them, and the opportunity for customer feedback and iteration are the two things we see, think are absolutely critical. Been through the physical incubation piece, which happened at RTBI. Were there other facilities that an academic incubator could bring to bear 
uh, that you know, was really useful and valuable to you? Uh, what's the role of academic incubators? Do you get enough of a business input, or is a lot of it more technical uh, at the academic incubator? And the other question is specialization versus generalization. Would you have benefited from being part of an academic institution or incubator that specialized in, say, which is your area of expertise, or do you think that's not as important because you guys were figuring out the technical stuff yourself? Okay, so you know, I'll answer both questions separately. The first one of the value of the academic incubator versus a more commercial uh, incubator. I think for us, the fact that we were going to be a technology-based business working on IPR and in creating IPR and technology, uh, I think for us it was important to be associated with the academic incubator who had the kind of people who could guide us in that process as well, apart from business inputs. Uh, I think, um, as I said, in our, in our diligence of the kind of people that RTBI had, we figured that uh, there was the opportunity to get both advices, uh, technical as well as business. I think the few other things that an academic incubator can easily bring to the table is, is sort of uh, access to field trials for some of the newer technologies and initiators, because academic institutes uh, do attract a lot of government and uh, grant-related programs which allow them to try out new things, to pilot new things. And some of our technologies were, were built, fine-tuned, and tested uh, through such initiatives. Um, also, to that extent, uh, policy advocacy, academic institutes tend to have a lot more reach and voice in, uh, in government and policy-related uh, matters, where you know, the advocacy of, in our case, a new technology or a new way of doing things um, can be achieved uh, through the academic institute. Um, I think so for, in that perspective for us it worked. Um, and then to your question of uh, general versus a specialist uh, incubation program, that I think is, is important from the incubator's brand building perspective. Because one of the things that the incubator should obviously uh, do and be good at is have forward linkages to next round of investors and so on and so forth. And the investors would, would also appreciate and, and put more credibility to an incubator which says that, hey, I have a set of mentors with 100 years of experience in, in a industry. And I'm bringing out new and cutting edge companies in that industry, right? So there is a lot of credibility to what I'm saying and what I'm bringing out, I think, to the follow on investors and to customers. And from a brand of the incubator perspective, I think being a specialist in my mind does help. Gives me a good segue into a question to you, Dave, which is around the brand that the incubator adds to the enterprise. Uh, you know, are you able to kind of discern that there are some incubators who do good, solid work, and therefore they apply in some sense the filter that you spoke about, and that I know that they, if there's an entrepreneur who went through this program or even got selected, it's like you know anybody who gives a, a, a IIT or an IIM graduate a job knows that they've been through an intensely difficult selection process, so that brand itself, you know, assures them of certain level of quality. So, uh, you know, do you use some, do you find also a reasonable alignment between the way the incubator thinks of an enterprise and the way you think of an enterprise? Uh, do they really have that business sense and that investment sense, especially when we're talking academic incubators, uh, who might get excited by a technology per se, but haven't thought of, you know, maybe the you know, implications and whatnot. Uh, how do you see that? that brand, that filtering, that alignment with the way in which you look at outputs from an incubator? Right. No, I think it's a great question. Um, I think the, the, the answer, the quick answer is there's, there's really mixed results um, so far. I think um, one, of the, one of the questions I think, you, you, if you want to think about, is some of you may know some of the incubators um, you know, that have been operating in India. And one of the questions um, you could ask a bunch of investors would be, and I was asking some other investors today, I said, okay, for the social uh, business in, uh, incubators in India today, which of them actually, uh, if someone goes through an incubator, and particularly if they, they become a, a leader, you know, the leading winner or whatever, if there's a, a, a program uh, in an incubator, how many of you consider that uh, an increase, you, you would actually look more closely at investing in them? And unfortunately, the people in the audience said very few incubators here have that, that, that social cueing to investors. In other words, if you've graduated from most incubators here, um, 
uh, in India, so far at least, most investors don't generally view that as you being more investable. Um, and I think that is something that can change, and there are some that actually do have a, po a very positive thing. And I think that's actually one of the critical things that you want to evaluate uh, if you're running an incubator, and also uh, as you're looking at an incubator as an entrepreneur, is you want to have a positive signaling. If you're mm -hmm. going to mm -hmm. put time in, you want this to result um, in something where, you know, when you put it on your investor presentation that I went through this incubator or I won this, that actually it means, oh, okay, I should look at this more carefully. And I think one of the reasons, comes back to your second point, is that um, the programs are not, uh, many of the programs here are not run by leadership that has this entrepreneur sort of investor mindset to it, to help the entrepreneurs uh, develop their, their thinking, uh, develop their, their presentation uh, of, of their business, um, prepare for the hard questions an investor would ask, um, those kind of activities that make them more prepared for um, and more thoughtful about and, uh, and more ready for an investor. So I, I think that, um, and again, there are, and I'm, by the way, I'm focusing on, when I say investor, I'm focusing on for-profit. If you're focusing on uh, incubating or, or accelerating nonprofits, it's, it's really thinking towards the funders in that case, whether they, you know, whatever the funding mechanism you're going to have. So it's really the funding, the funding mechanism. And the reason that I think this is, um, is really critical is um, I think, uh, the good news, as I said earlier, is I think there's going to be a whole bunch more incubator, accelerator programs for social business in the next couple of years launched in India. The bad news is that, um, or the, the concerning news I have, or the, the, the crisis that I think could come out of this, is we get hundreds of new businesses launched and they don't get invested in. So they, they die an early death. And so you build expectations and hope, but you're, you're, you're not... Um, moving things far enough along. And there's a couple factors there. One is there's the factor of incubators finding the right entrepreneurs and then moving them forward in, in a way that makes them more investable. The second challenge, which I throw out there, is um, one of the ones we're trying to address, um, and we need more uh, groups like us, which is providing that next stage of funding uh, to take those ideas and allow them to develop. Because most people coming out of incubators are not going to be ready to raise a million dollars. Five crore, whatever you know, amount of money, which is uh, you know to really accelerate growth. You're going to need to take those ideas, and you're going to need to go out in the field, in, in the market, and you're going to need to validate them further. You're going to need to refine your unit economics and go down the list of things before an investor who's willing to write you a big check is going to be ready to do that. So I, I think that's a crisis that's actually brewing um, uh, in India, especially if we start accelerating the number of these uh, graduates from incubators. Right, which actually segues to a question back to Manfred, and this is going to be a, a difficult question for you, Manfred, which is the question of quantity versus quality. You know, we already have 100 plus, but I, I, I think you can count on your fingertips, and Dave might disagree with me here, that there are very few that are really good quality programs. Part of it is leadership, and that there is the inability of incubators to attract former entrepreneurs to really run these programs. And partly that's because of a legal structure that causes most of them to be set up as nonprofits to be driven by grants and things like that. So unlike a, a Y Combinator or something like that, which takes equity and generates returns, has a certain sustainability built into it, we haven't seen any such model in India. And so I was wondering if you have perspectives on how can incubators, how can a self-sustaining incubation model be created where it can attract that quality of entrepreneurial talent, a former entrepreneur to run it, uh, and, you know, then raise the quality, really, in terms of incubation. I told you this is going to be a difficult question, so okay. <laughs> I'd love to hear if you have some thoughts. Great. What's the premium? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that, that's probably the question of the questions, no? Yeah. Um, to take up from, from him and come to your point. Um, see, I'm coming from agriculture, and I know if you give the wrong fertilizer, <laughs> either it's useless or it is poisonous. Right. Um, so if you want this thing to grow, you have to give it the right fertilizer. And the question is, what is the right fertilizer? And if I look in our own experience and what I have learned in the six years here in India, sometimes policymakers and others tend to throw money at problems and then hope that it goes away. I'm afraid it's not going to happen. Yeah. Yeah? We have seen it in other, in other areas also. So maybe money is not the issue. So what is the bottleneck yeah, uh, that could make this grow? 
and one thing the filter and entrepreneurship insight because entrepreneur insight right. yeah so how do i get into this system entrepreneurs with experience so you have the e for e yeah um, and how do you get that and and i think here government can do something else than just giving money which is uh, say work with pride instead of money um, you have a lot of good entrepreneurs in india and uh, they look up to government and maybe mobilizing them to do some function some work as mentors and as as, as even as uh, officials in, in in incubators and other organizations would really make a difference so that's one observation the other one See, there was one, one guy about system theory in Germany. He said, you know, there is intelligent organizations which work with very simple people, and they do a great, a great job. And there are a lot of a bunch of very intelligent people in stupid organizations, and they don't get their act together. Right. Yeah, so one uh, example was, say, McDonald's. Yeah, that was the smart organization with the normal people, mm -hmm. and the German universities in the 1980s. That was his example for a, a rather dumb organization with a lot of intelligent people. Mm -hmm. So it, the matter is, how do you develop the organization or the institutional setting in which this can unfold? Mm -hmm. And I would then also include others, and not just say the traditional incubators, because there's a lot there. Yeah, there's NGOs there. Most of them don't serve the purpose, but again, it's always about filtering, yeah? because you can always find these 10% that are great. So find the great NGOs, find the great ch associations, chambers at the local level, uh, there are cluster development agencies, uh, and, and build a system out of them, and somehow find a way of, of governing it. I, I don't know how to do it at the moment, right. yeah? but I would look into that direction. Okay, wonderful. That's a very useful suggestion, and in fact, some of the work that you're doing around getting incubators to share best practices, I think, perhaps can be the foundation of that intelligent organization. So, you know, we've been going for about 40, 45 minutes now. We have about half an hour left, so I'd love to throw it open uh, for questions to, you know, the audience, if there's anybody. And is there a mic that's, uh, that can be handed out, perhaps? So, you have another microphone? Another microphone back there? Oh, you're there. If you can just pass him the mic. Thank you. Good evening. So I just had this question for the panelists. Getting started uh, uh, with students, especially in their undergrads, and uh, allowing them to uh, make a lot of experiments in terms of social sector and incubating them in, in all their failures and experiments. What, what is your take on this and uh, how, how to get, go along with the investors on this kind of approach? Uh, sure. It will be good if you can share some yeah, ideas. Yeah. Maybe I'll start with Umesh, who started as a student project. His first entrepreneurial venture was when he was a student. Uh, maybe you can share some of your experience and then after that, Ross, have you mm -hmm. worked with students before? Or, sure, yeah. Uh, you know, I'd love to hear your thoughts. So I think um, the answer lies in, in creating different stages of, of uh, the incubation or accelerator program. So when we joined ID Madras, while we were coming out of a venture that we had started, was making money, but we wanted to do something of larger scale, we were called uh, potential incubators at that time. Right. So people who will do a lot of experimentation and trials, if something comes out of it which is worthy of you know being called as a business venture, we would go on to become incubators. Um, and that that took eight months. Uh, for us. So while we were developing certain things, as I said, we were creating IPR, there were a lot, lot of trials, uh, there was patent filing and so on and so forth involved in that. I think some of the things that uh, an organization like Wilgro is doing is creating different stages. There is the seed program now which is coming in. There's also talk of something else coming in much before even the seed program. It's the before the, in residence. Uh, before the actual incubation you know, program happens. So I think the answer lies in identifying, uh, as, as Dave was mentioning, uh, potentially high growth entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. They could be students. Giving them an opportunity before the formal incubation program, because the contours of that may not allow you to do a lot of experimentation and fine tuning. But a different sort of program which allows you to do that, and that has its own set of filtering, its own set of uh, outcomes. And saying that some of those early stage people could go on to join the incubation program. And some of the then incubation companies could go on to raise further rounds of funding. So I think filtration at different stages 
is really the answer. Yeah, I would, I would say two things. Um, one is good customer identification. I'm going to throw this question out to the audience. Um, just shout it out if you want to answer. Who is Google's customer? Someone speak up. Can't hear anybody. Advertisers, yes, this is a smart crowd. Usually when I ask this, people are like, oh, it's everybody. We all use Google. Um, Google's customers, advertisers. Google's beneficiaries, all of us. We, get, we can find out whatever we want. But um, Google has built a service that has analytics, data, et cetera, that gets you ad account executive at, I don't know, Mahindra or whoever to buy, buy ads on this for this particular search. I think a lot of times, um, I think that there are incubators where enterprise development is the goal, and in that case, entrepreneurs are your customer. If you, what you are talking about right here, how do we get investors to care about these companies? A lot of times, um, incubators, accelerators treat entrepreneurs as customer and say, why don't, the, why don't any investors like these guys? Uh, you have to treat the investor as your customer and say, hey, Dave, I'm working with students. What would you like? And he was like, I'm really interested in medical devices and Indian, you know, and Indi coming out of these Indian universities that can have IP potential. Then that gives you a thought of how to build your incubator. I mean, we think about this in developing our programs. Our customer uh, for our partnership with CIIE is the investment committee of Arohan Ventures because they're looking for pipeline for their fund. We're... Um, very excited to be exploring an education-focused cohort this fall with the Pearson Affordable Learning Fund. Uh, and we're looking for things that Pearson Affordable Learning Fund would want to invest directly in. And that's, that's the main reason why we're doing this, this partnership. And so um, figure out what, not what you think would be amazing for Pearson to care about, but what Pearson wants to invest in and build a product for them that, that, they'll, that they'll pay for. Great. Questions from the audience? Lady up here. Um, we have a mic. Shout it out there. It's coming up. Go for it. yeah, it's coming up. Yeah, Go for it. Yeah, please. So I'm Amber Meltzer, and I work for the Pearson Affordable Learning Fund, so I'm the partner. That she is our customer. Ross was just talking yeah. about. Um, but my question for the panel is, as somebody who's going to embark on setting up an incubator focused on a specialty of education, are there any potential pitfalls that I should be trying to avoid as I plan this program? If some huckster from a group called Village Capital says we should work together, don't listen to him. <laughs> that was a joke. You guys, just, come on. I wanted more laughter for that. That was a total misfire. <laughs> Manfred, do you have any other thoughts and suggestions for her from your experience? Well, I, I, one thing I would suggest is uh, talk to some other, what, what you view as, uh, as, as working incubators to find out the people. I mean, I don't run an incubator, so I, I don't think I'd be a, a great person to talk to. I mean, I can talk, uh, talk from the perspective as an investor, so I'd, I'd love to have that conversation. But I, I would encourage you to look at what you, you uh, incubators you like and find out what are the nuances. I mean, these guys obviously partnering with you bring a lot of interesting ideas to the table, but uh, who, else, who else would you talk to to find out what they've learned? Yeah. So, you know, I, from Wilgro's perspective, I can add a few thoughts. Um, I think Wilgro, at Wilgro, we've realized that you cannot set up an incubator and expect people to, you know, uh, walk in the door and expect to be incubated. You have to actively go out and build pipeline, especially in social businesses focused on the BOP in India. And so I think if you're setting up an education-focused incubator, Partner with organizations like the guy, you know, the Kai Valya, the Gandhi Fo uh, Fellowship, or with the Teach for India Fellowship, which are potentially sources of pipeline for you. Because if you don't actively go out and source pipeline, you're not going to get good quality uh, entrepreneurs coming in. The second thing is listen to people like Dave and align your program so that when you start off somebody in the incubation program, you know what sorts of milestones and what risks you need to mitigate by the end of the program for Dave to be interested in investing in them. And then you can put your money and your mentors and everything else that you're providing to work on hitting those very specific milestones. And I think that's the way in which you will add the greatest value to those entrepreneurs. Because you're not pursuing those ideas for ideas' sake. You're pursuing those ideas so that they get funded, so that they scale, and so that they impact people. Because otherwise, you know, it's not that you want to develop cool technology. It's that you want to have impact. And so that's the other suggestion 
that I'd have to provide from uh, Wilgro's perspective. Yeah, the, the, go ahead. Just thinking the 5%, if that 5 or 4% number is somehow correct, yeah, the pipeline would have to be 100 to have 5 at the end. And you have to have that pipeline in order to have that filter, or else you end up with the wrong people. Right. So it's, it's really important to have an idea of the dimension of how much you have to have in the pipeline. Right. Yeah. I mean, the other thing I'd say, and I have said this to you, but I will say it for the benefit of the audience, is, is you know, a single investor, a single funder can't make an entire ecosystem. So if you're on the funding side and thinking about working in incubation acceleration, figure out who you want to co-invest with. Figure out who you want to work with. Um, get them to sponsor tracks at the incubator so they have a little skin in the game making sure the pipeline is good. We've done that with, with CIIE. We have track sponsors in mobile and in energy of people who sit on our investment committee and get a say in who's in the group. And so if you're interested in education and Dave's interested in education and you think you might want to deal a do a deal with Dave, you know, get Dave more involved than informally, hey, you know, uh, wouldn't it be nice for us to talk sometime? So, so figure out who else is doing what you're doing that you want to work with and, and, and build a formal role for them into the, into the program. Manuela had a question there. No? Okay, go. The young lady there. Someone pass her the microphone. So my question is regarding the topic sets. It's basically incubating the incubators, as in there's some necessity required at the stage of incubators themselves, which is currently present. So what I want to know is that there's a high touch incubation possible and there's a low touch incubation possible. So high touch where I mean that people actually go on to where the uh, source of where the work is happening and uh, involve themselves into doing things like that, which I am aware of, I'm not aware of all, but something like the Acumen Fellows go uh, into the particular organization and work with them and solve those things. So I just want to know, so when you talk about incubating the incubators, is there, is there a particular way uh, or a particular convention we are trying to develop here where uh, it'll be more possible to do some high touch incubation uh, because of course it has its own costs and other uh, problems associated with it. But how, how do we uh, you know, come across that challenge which might be more uh, reactive as well as might be more uh, you know, insightful for the social entrepreneurs? or any entrepreneur for that matter. So <clears throat> we've seen incubators operate at many different points of the spectrum. You've got, at the one end, you know, completely passive incubators who provide you with simply office space and uh, little else. And on the other hand, you've got incubators who provide you with much more, such as mentors who work with you deeply in the field, money, uh, access to prototyping facilities, and so on and so forth. So they're deeply uh, engaged with the way in which you create your business. I think um, the discussion in the earlier stages of the panel is that incubators who are more involved uh, with their entrepreneurs, helping them um, think through the business and develop the business, have had a greater impact uh, you know, in terms of the quality of the ideas that come out at the end of it. And so I think, uh, you know, if I can paraphrase the panel's opinion, it is more engagement uh, with uh, this thing, instead of being sages on the stage, be guides on the side, but help the entrepreneur really think through and do a lot of this stuff. Uh, and uh, that's the uh, more effective model of incubation, I think, is uh, you know, the suggestion that we have here. Uh, in terms of incubating incubators, I think GIZ has been trying to create programs, and in fact, there's one that you're launching, I think, next week at uh, CIIE in Ahmedabad where they're bringing in incubator center managers and things like that to share best practices and lessons uh, and to learn from each other about how to set up and run an effective incubation program. Manfred, if you want to talk a little more about that, uh, left to Shashank is also here if you want to talk about uh, no, that. That we're doing? up here. You know more about this than all of us. <laughs> right. <laughs> You're the guide on the You're side. incubating us. <laughs> I think there's a, a, a curve of diminishing returns. Yeah? Again, this 4%, 5%, 6%, how many of 100 can be entrepreneurs? And of course, high touch, you may shift from 4 to 5 or 6% or something like that. But there's a curve of diminishing returns, and high touch also at the end will mean high, high cost. 
So if your, say, success criteria is uh, return after five years in, 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 in the enterprises versus what you have invested into their incubation, then there is a, a cutoff somewhere. Um, and maybe what we all have to do also is to promise us a little bit of transparency and to measure, uh, say, the, the results of what we're doing and, and learn from it. I don't think there is a, a rule in the rule book somewhere where you have to, to cut. Um, but if you look at the data afterwards, you will find that at a certain stage, uh, it's better to invest in the strong cases. Please. It's a, a microphone. Co it's a collaborative thing. So as you said, there can be high-touch incubators. They can be very passive incubators. What we are trying to say is, along with Unlimited and GIZ, we are trying to see if we can move a lot of these organizations, the organizations that Manfred talked about, NGOs, industry bodies, from playing a passive role to a more active role in incubation process. And trying to tell them that it's not that hard a job if you already know the community in case of a social business. Uh, the idea is that after these initiatives are done, we'll also handhold, so we'll have these awesome incubators like Unlimited, Will Grow, CIA, who will be also mentoring other new organizations who are coming in. So the active incubators, which have been around incubating enterprises, will actively incubate more incubators as well. So that's the larger thought that GIZ has. And hopefully. That was my question, whether yeah. we are building another pipeline where the, the new incubators, or rather how are we trying so, to this So there are a lot of activities. So the way incubators, incubators are generally very questioning kind of people are very good at incubation. So, so the good thing is that people like Paul and people like Guns will also question whether we are adding enough value or not. And hence, what Guns was talking about, there's an enough attempt to collaborate within incubators. There's enough attempt. Now, there's an there's a introspection which is happening. I don't know whether Guns has talked about that, which will hopefully change the landscape, the incubation landscape. There are stalwarts of incubation system already present. So there's Ten from RTBI, there's Pooja from Unlimited, Paul from Wilgro. So these are people who you should connect and see if they are willing to handhold a new fledgling incubator. Yeah, in fact, we are specifically uh, open to somebody coming and staying with us through the fellowship for a year, just watching what we do, learning, and then taking those best practices into their own incubator. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll move on. Amy, you had a question, I think. Uh, if you can pass the microphone on to her, please. So I'd like to get really specific, and I'd love to hear from each of you what you think specific impact measure, measures should be for incubators or accelerators. We're big on impact measures for the businesses that come out of us, but what should those impact measures be for the actual accelerator or incubator? Yeah, we've been struggling with this, so that's the tough question. Uh, enterprises have impact, obviously, on the BOP. Uh, how much of that impact can we take credit for? I think we can take credit for them having impact faster or, or they're having greater impact on a shorter timeline for the resources. And that really is the way that I think an incubator should be measuring itself. One approach that we've been following, and we haven't fully implemented this yet, is developing a maturity rubric of the enterprise. And if our job is to really build that maturity, to take them from idea through to commercial, uh, uh, you know, whether uh, earning revenues from paying customers, and you define stages along the way, uh, measuring the speed with which you can move mm -hmm. an organization mm -hmm. along that pathway, I think could be the best measure of the effectiveness of, the, of an incubator and how much money and resources that it's uh, spending in that particular process. But um, I'd love to hear an entrepreneur's perspective on how an incubator should measure itself. No, I think uh, I would completely agree with what Gant said. From, from an enterprise perspective, um, you know, the, the best outcome of an incubation program is that we move from one stage to the other faster. And we actually do move, which, you know, outside of the incubator program is, is sort of suspect. It's, you know, based on our ability and experience, which is the gap that incubators are filling. Uh, I think to that extent, from a social impact perspective, once the incubator has done the filtering that, hey, 
this is the sort of company I'm incubating. Mm -hmm. In their business model, there is a uh, social impact to be had. Beyond that point, it is about how fast can you scale up the company, can you make it financially viable, um, can you allow them to hit the next few milestones, which is either next round of funding or, you know, uh, the next million dollars in revenue. I think that's just the, the, the real job that the incubator should focus on and measure itself on. I think it's a great question. Uh, I think there's actually some critique. I was talking to someone the other day that was asking about Y Combinator and Techstars in the US, which are these very popular um, accelerators for tech companies. And the comment was they get what, 10 in? I can't remember how many are each cohort. It's a small, small number. Right? 10. 10. Let's say 10. They get something like six or 700 applicants. So they're picking, let's say, the cream of the crop. But the question is, are they really adding more value, or are they actually really just doing a good job of filtering and focusing the attention on the best entrepreneurs? Right. Helping them some, but and it's a, I think it's a fair question. And I guess, you know, the, the person was saying, so I'm not sure that the model works. And on the other hand, he says, they're providing a value in the marketplace because they're, they're helping focus the attention um, on people. Uh, maybe they're adding some value. But it's really hard to take credit for the results necessarily. Yeah. Um, I do think um, that it is um, very helpful to track uh, uh, how much, I think a simple metric to track is how much capital uh, has been raised by companies that, that graduate from your program, et cetera, because it is a proxy at least, mm -hmm. one proxy for, um, if, if these companies have impact built into their business DNA. Left a little later uh, than Vilgro's seed program, which I think is terrific. Um, Vilgro's seed program is, is great because they have a volume impact thesis and they're willing and very comfortable around a high rate of enterprises not being successful just, just because they're trying to, to seed an ecosystem. And um, that's, that's an absolutely necessary role that, that philanthropy needs to fill. When you start to get into investment, um, we used to track capital leveraged as a primary metric. Um, we've actually shifted a bit to revenue growth over time because I think what we found were um, a lot of companies were great at raising the next round, um, and you know it was, it was almost like like we had some professional fundraisers in our in our cohort. I love all our companies equally, so I would tell this to their face. Uh, but focusing too much on fundraising and not enough on revenue. Um, but revenue growth over time as a percentage since they came through a cohort is, is a uh, metric that we track because we, we view our biggest programmatic value add as this customer development, sales development mentality. And so revenue is, is most linked to where we think we are, we are most useful. So I would, um, I would say figure out what you really want to do and find the key operational impact metric that is most closely tied to that. All what you said, and then put it into relationship to your own efforts and costs, yeah, so that you have input sort of an input-output measurement. And maybe one, yeah. one variable, which is, um, does it allow failing fast? Right. Yeah, that would be an additional one. Okay. That lady in blue there next to the camera actually has been waiting for a question for some time. Uh, you can pass the microphone there. There was a lot of discussion around the idea that the most viable models for these incubators are those that look at a specific sector or look at a certain growth trajectory, common growth trajectory among the, the businesses. But what about a framework that looks at not basing it off of this commonality, but instead looking at a specifically disadvantaged group of people who face similar social or financial or legal challenges to starting a business, like in the United States, former prisoners or immigrants or in India, certain castes or religions. Um, how can this still be a viable model if they all have different business plans and different kind of trajectories they're going on? And what sort of, how would this shift the kind of public and financial alliances that they would need to still be viable? Well, first of all, I, I, th I think it, it seems like people think that incubators are viable business models. That's also false. Um, <laughs> We, we did a study of 68 impact-focused incubators around the world, including a lot of the people in this conference, and $8 out of 10 that every incubator spends comes from philanthropy. So um, this is not a, to your point of, of how do we 
pay the bills here. This is not quite outside of consumer technology in two or three cities in the world, not quite a monetizable thing. Um, so again, if, if you care about um, providing support to a particular disadvantaged community, you know, the funder or investor, I think, is the primary customer of the incubator. Figure out people who have the resources to make that happen. Figure out what their incentives are. And in some ways, um, respond, re build something that aligns with both your impact objectives and, and theirs. I don't know if that, that was an indirect answer to your question to say, I think you're, you're setting up a straw man that's not of like the, 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 the self-sustaining incubator that I don't think is true. But I also think you'll have a challenge of you know, critical mass of entrepreneurial opportunities if you define really that segment very narrowly. But if there is substantial critical mass, then yes, it becomes viable. But I you know, just gut feel is that's where the challenge would be. Manuela had a question, which you've been waiting for a while again. And we'll come back to maybe the last one. Yeah, you talked about what Ross just said, and the payout of $10. Am I audible? Yeah, you can um, use the microphone there. Then I mean, looking forward, maybe in 10, 20 years, what do you think would be the perfect future for funding of the incubation? Also looking at all this pipeline that has to be f done before. I mean, we'll grow seed is one thing, but then there's a new program before that. And we've talked about maybe social business plan competitions at universities. I mean, there's so many pre, pre, pre steps. So who pays the bill, in your opinion, in, in the future? What would be the really good scenario? Um... That's a question for you, Dave. I mean, at the end of the day, the one who's um earning the return is the investor at the end of it, would investors at some point begin to at least pay a piece of it? Would entrepreneurs begin to pay a piece of it with equity to these incubators permit, you know, assuming the legal environment permitted it? Right. But, uh, well, what, what's happened in, in some of the more successful programs in the U.S., we can use that as, a, as an example, is the ones that have been able to consistently um, attract a very good crop of entrepreneurs and graduate them, um, they have um, uh, been able to get investors to pre-commit. So in some of these programs, investors will pre-commit to invest, uh, in some cases, a mi you know, minimum for every, every entrepreneur who gets into the program. So obviously that model, if you can create your quality of result high enough through some mechanism over time, then that could be one way that at least um, subsidizes it further. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm, generally skeptical that for a lot of these, similar to probably to Ross, um, is that, the, that there is a model. I mean, most R&D, which is a lot of you know, support, which a lot of this is, is globally subsidized. There's very few models of uh, th these kind of activities uh, that are purely commercial, um, funded. So I think you can be more leveraged, right, in the sense of how rather than $8, maybe you get it down to $4 or, or whatever, some over time through by increasing the value of your program or um, by effectively making your program so successful that funders, even if they're grant funders, you spend a lot less time talking to them <laughs> to give them the money to continue to do it because you have such good results. But that, again, that's, that's my thought. So Umesh, your perspective, and you know, would you be willing to part with equity to pay for incubation? Do you think your, the demand you would have placed on your incubator would have been much, much more if you had to part with something instead of get things for free? So incidentally, uh, IIT Madras does hold a little bit of okay. e uh, equity in, in our company. Um, and I think that's, that's only fair. A lot of the new crop of accelerators, even in India, and even in the US by accelerators, do take equity. Yeah. Uh, I don't think the entrepreneurs would mind uh, you know, that in, in lieu of the value that they perceive the incubator is providing. As I said, the entrepreneur, end of the day, has his own way of uh, doing a diligence on the incubator, whether that value can be provided or not. But the point is that given the state of where incubation is in India, it will be a long time, even if incubators do start taking equity before exits happen, will the second day exit even be possible if the next uh, investor is willing to commit? Is he committing towards a secondary buyout of the incubator or, or a subsequent round in which the incubator further waits for a longer time mm -hmm. before seeing some exit? Uh, so I think equity giving out to the incubator should not be an issue for entrepreneurs, but Will that result in sustainability of the incubator in a short term is still a question mark. Alfred, do you have any perspectives on innovative models that have been followed perhaps to fund a lot of that pre-pre-pre work that goes on? I mean, to start with, uh, something in, inside me says, you know, this is a private good. You know, they can monetize it. Why don't they pay for it? Right. Right? Um, I mean, 
I mean, there, that, that's where you would start conceptually thinking about it. Uh, but maybe it's not a black and white question in the sense of maybe it's not either philanthropic or either public or uh, the, the, how you call him? Uh, the, the entrepreneur would have to pay for it. Maybe you have a way of, for example, as I said, pay as you grow. Uh, you get shares or something, and if the guy is successful, he'll pay. And maybe you find a way of setting the incentives right and allow him to fail and not end up in debt up to here. Yeah, so, matter of how you put that in detail, but it could could work like that. And yeah, yeah. No, I, I heard there's an incubator that we work with in Brazil called Artemisia. That um, similar line in terms of impact revenue growth is is really how they they focus all their all their program and value add. And they say if you clear one million reais in revenue, we would ask for donation of ten thousand reais to to Artemisia. If you if you don't hit it, you don't pay. But that's that's what we would, that's what we'd like if you hit this. And there, that's what they say. We, we're trying to get you to one million reais, five hundred thousand US in revenue when you come in. That's our that's our goal, and that's where we're going to get you. There's another model uh, in the US that's uh, this group called Fledge, uh, which is running a social business accelerator, and their model is to um, uh, make a small investment. I think it's something like seven or ten thousand uh, dollars in each of the companies that join the cohort. Uh, and the, the structure, though, is not a traditional equity structure. It's a, a revenue-based financing structure. And so um, I know there's complications for FDI in India with these kind of things, but um, uh, this is the idea that, that you get a small percentage of the, the revenue that's generated from the business up to a certain amount mm -hmm. uh, as a way of repaying. So you don't have, you're not relying on you know, an exit from an equity and things like that, but there is sort of a, a way of paying back. Right. Uh, to the incubator. I really like that model. I think actually it's, it's very, uh, it, 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 the way they've structured it, very much as the business grows, they pay a little bit more, you know, they pay more back. Yeah. So. That's partly the work that uh, John Kohler at Santa Clara University has done around both demand dividend as well as royalty link tree mm -hmm. payments and mm -hmm. early investments as yeah. a means of generating exits and things like that. I'm afraid that's, uh, that's all the time that we have for, so I apologize for people who still have questions waiting. Uh, maybe a quick set of uh, concluding remarks. Uh, we'll start with Manfred, perhaps. Well, just the last argument. I think uh, giving tax money, taxpayers' money or philanthropic money to the offer of services may not be the best of, of, of the worlds. Maybe the, a system where you give uh, a subsidy to the client and the client has, that's the entrepreneur then, has the choice to which incubator to go uh, is a better system in the long run. Yeah, but you would have to still do a little bit of homework. Yeah, I would, I would close and say probably the, the biggest shift in our model in the last year is this pretty strong focus on investor as customer of our incubator um, and building cohorts that have very strong investor input and buy-in. And I would say um, if I could advise you to do one thing, think of what your thing, what your, what your group would look like. If you are talking about investment as a value proposition, what investor as customer rather than entrepreneur as customer would look like? Because if the investors are happy, I guarantee you your entrepreneurs are going to be happy. Ditto. <laughs> so I think just to you know take that thought forward, if if the shift is really focusing to the investor as being the customer, I think one provocative thought could be that. The beneficiary of the program is eventually the investor who's getting a good pipeline, you know, in, in an ideal situation. And then what, what sort of monetary fees would the investor be willing to do a part of that kind of, you know, pipeline creation program? Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. Appreciate, uh, you know, your time. Thank you for being on the panel. Thank you to the audience. For having we have a quick set of mementos. Thank you all. Thank you all so much. Uh, we just have some gifts to give you. Mr. Manfred of GIZ, thank you. <laughs> Here. <laughs> Ross Baird of Village Capital, thank you. Dave Richards, Unitas. Umesh of Unifor, thank you so much.
And thank you, Guns, for your moderation. Thank you all. I'm sure you're all eager to get, get lunch. <laughs>